In a tumultuous time in Israel, where the Philistines held oppressive dominion over the land, the scene of Samson's birth unfolds. Endowed with a divine destiny, he is born under the promise to become a Nazirite, consecrated to God's service among the people of Israel. A thread of hope woven by the hands of the Most High, endowing him with singular strength, entrusted with a grand mission. It is in the Book of Judges that this epic narrative unfolds, revealing the extraordinary deeds of this sacred hero. And the children of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for forty years. Judges chapter 13 verse 1 At this point in the story, we are introduced to Manoah, a man whose wife faced the anguish of barrenness. Now there was a certain man from Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Judges 13 verses 2 and 3. This singular event echoes in biblical narrative, paralleling the conception of Isaac in the Old Testament and the birth of John in the New Testament. The birth of this promised child carries with it the crucial mission of freeing Israel from the yoke of the Philistines. However, with this divine purpose comes a unique condition, unlike any other judge before him. The angel instructs Manoah's wife to raise the child according to the Nazirite vow, a consecrated promise explained in the book of Numbers. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when either a man or woman consecrates an offering to take the vow of a Nazirite to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and similar drink. He shall drink neither vinegar made from wine nor vinegar made from similar drink. Neither shall he drink any grape juice nor eat fresh grapes or raisins. All the days of his separation he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine from seed to skin. All the days of the vow of his separation, no razor shall come upon his head. Until the days are fulfilled for which he separated himself to the Lord, he shall be holy. Then he shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. Numbers 6 verses 1 to 5 This sacred commitment involved abstaining from wine or beer, as well as the prohibition of cutting one's hair. Interestingly, the angel also instructed the woman to avoid consuming wine or beer during pregnancy and to abstain from impure foods. These restrictions pointed to the early consecration of her child to God's service as a Nazirite, even before his birth. Even though she had received the celestial message directly, the woman shared the instructions with her husband. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O oh my Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come to us again and teach us what we shall do for the child who will be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came to the woman again as she was sitting in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. Then the woman hurried and ran to tell her husband and said to him, Look, the man who came to me the other day has appeared to me. So Manoah arose and followed his wife. When he came to the man, he said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. Manoah said, Now let your words come to pass. What will be the boy's rule of life and his work? So the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. Judges 13 verses 8 to 13. Manoah, perhaps mistaking the visitor for a mere man sent by the Lord, offered him hospitality, suggesting he stay while they prepared a young goat for a feast. The visitor accepted the offer to stay, but refused to eat, instructing that a burnt offering would be more appropriate. When Manoah placed the offering upon the rock as requested, something miraculous occurred. The visitor ascended in the flames and departed into the heavens. Faced with this wonder, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces to the ground. In a moment of fear, Manoah recognized the divine presence, expressing concern that they would die for having seen the face of God. Thus, he correctly identified the angel of the Lord as God himself. 
Then Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it upon the rock to the Lord, and he did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. It happened as the flame went up toward heaven from the altar. The angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. And the angel of the Lord did not appear again to Manoah or his wife. Then Manoah realized that it was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die, for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands, or shown us all these things, or now announced to us such things as these. And the woman bore a son, and called his name Samson. And the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him, and the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Mahanedan, between Zorah and Eshtaol. Judges 13 verses 19 to 24. God poured his blessings upon Samson, and the Spirit of the Lord began to guide him, preparing him for the great work that awaited him. However, despite being consecrated from birth, Samson made questionable decisions throughout his journey, thus revealing the complexity of divine intervention in human life. His visit to Timnah and his desire to marry a young Philistine woman surprised his parents, who tried to advise him wisely, warning him against union with someone outside the people of God. However, they were unaware that Samson's interest in this specific woman was part of the divine plan, an opportunity provided by the Lord for an imminent confrontation with the Philistines. And Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. But his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives, or among all our people, that you must go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. At that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel, Judges 14 verses 1 to 4. During his journey to Timnah where his future wife lived, Samson faced a formidable challenge. A young lion attacked him. At this crucial moment, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him with irresistible power, and Samson, without any weapon, tore the lion apart with his bare hands. This extraordinary feat was powerful evidence that he had been chosen and empowered by God for a supernatural mission. Then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah, and behold, a young lion came toward him roaring, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and he tore the lion apart, as one tears apart a young goat, and he had nothing in his hand. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she was right in Samson's eyes. Judges 14, 5, 7 Samson decided to challenge the Philistines with a riddle during a banquet, which likely served as his engagement feast. The prize for solving the riddle within a week would be thirty linen garments, a sign of honor and prestige in biblical times. Reflecting on his recent experience of confronting the lion and finding honey inside the animal, Samson posed the riddle. Out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. So his father went down to the woman, and Samson prepared a feast there, for so the young men used to do. As soon as the people saw him, they brought thirty companions to be with him. And Samson said to them, Let me now put a riddle to you. If you can tell me what it is within the seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you thirty linen garments and thirty changes of clothes. But if you cannot tell me what it is, then you shall give me thirty linen garments and thirty changes of clothes. And they said to him, Put your riddle, that we may hear it. And he said to them, Out of the eater came something to eat, out of the strong came something sweet. And in three days they could not solve the riddle. Judges 14 verses 10 to 14. The Philistines became furious at their inability to solve Samson's riddle. 
They threatened to kill Samson's wife, who was also a Philistine, and all her family, unless she could extract the answer from him. Terrified at the prospect of losing her life and that of her loved ones, she wept before Samson for seven long days until he could no longer bear to see her distressed. At her insistence, Samson revealed the answer, and the Philistines knew they had obtained it through her. Driven by the Spirit of the Lord, Samson killed thirty Philistine men in another city, fulfilling the agreement of the thirty sets of clothing. After this incident, he returned home, but his wife was no longer with him. In a second instance, Samson caused further devastation to the Philistines. When he attempted to visit his wife, he was stopped by his own father-in-law, who assumed that Samson no longer wanted her. In an act of retaliation, Samson destroyed the Philistines' crops by tying the tails of 300 foxes together with torches and releasing them into the fields. And it came to pass after a while, in the time of wheat harvest, that Samson visited his wife with a kid. And he said, I will go into my wife into the chamber, but her father would not allow him to go in. And her father said, I verily thought that thou hadst utterly hated her. Therefore I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. And Samson said concerning them, Now shall I be more blameless than the Philistines, though I do them a displeasure. And Samson went and caught three hundred foxes, and took firebrands, and turned tail to tail, and put a firebrand in the midst between two tails. And when he had set the brands on fire, he let them go into the standing corn of the Philistines, and burnt up both the shocks and also the standing corn, with the vineyards and olives. Judges 15 verses 1 to 5. In a cruel retaliation, the Philistines murdered Samson's wife and also her father. Consumed by grief and a desire for justice, Samson took vengeance upon himself without weapons in hand, but with fierce determination. And the Philistines said, Who hath done this? And they answered, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he had taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines came up and burnt her and her father with fire. And Samson said unto them, Though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that I will cease. And he smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter, and he went down and dwelt in the top of the rock Etam. Judges 15, verses 6 to 8. The Philistines, thirsting for revenge, besieged a village in Judah in search of Samson, while he took refuge in a cave. To appease their oppressors, 3,000 men of Judah decided to hand over Samson, claiming that his presence had brought trouble by provoking the anger of the Philistines. Here, irony reaches its peak. They handed over to the Philistines the one whom God had sent to deliver them from oppressive bondage. Reluctantly, Samson agreed to accompany them, but only after they assured him they would not kill him. And they said unto him, We are come down to bind thee, that we may deliver thee into the hand of the Philistines. And Samson said unto them, Swear unto me, that ye will not fall upon me yourselves. And they spake unto him, saying, No, but we will bind thee fast, and deliver thee into their hand, but surely we will not kill thee. And they bound him with two new cords, and brought him up from the rock. Judges 15 verses 12 and 13. When the Philistines saw Samson, bound and being led toward them, their shouts echoed. However, at that crucial moment, the Spirit of the Lord descended upon Samson with overwhelming intensity. For the Philistines, this was bad news, as confronting someone with the Spirit of the Lord by their side was a battle lost from the outset. Faced with the divine power driving him, the ropes that bound him became insignificant. Samson then found a fresh jawbone of a donkey and used it as a weapon to defeat a thousand men. Under the influence of the Lord, he accomplished what would have been humanly impossible. And he came unto Lehi, and the Philistines shouted against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands loosed from off his hands. And he found a new jawbone of an ass, and put forth his hand and took it, and slew a thousand men therewith. Judges 15 verses 14 and 15. 
After triumphing over the Philistines, Samson, exhausted and thirsty, called upon the Lord for help. In his grace, the Lord promptly responded, restoring Samson's strength by creating a spring in the location. This spring was named En Hakor, in memory of Samson's supplication. And thus, Samson led Israel for twenty years, fulfilling his role as judge over the people. And he was sore athirst, and called on the Lord and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant, and now shall I die for thirst, and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. But God clave an hollow place that was in the jaw, and there came water thereout. And when he had drunk, his spirit came again, and he revived. Wherefore he called the name thereof En Hakor, which is in Lehi unto this day. And he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines twenty years, Judges 15 verses 18 to 20. When the Spirit of the Lord descended upon Samson, it was accompanied by miraculous deeds. In the Old Testament, this manifestation of the Spirit occurred in response to specific circumstances. However, since the times of the New Testament, the Spirit of the Lord came to dwell in every believer, offering His constant guidance and power. In Him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 13 and 14. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Romans 8 verse 9. This indicates that on the side of the cross, the supernatural presence of God is no longer associated with the Spirit descending upon the faithful, but rather with the fullness of the Spirit operating within us. The Spirit came with power upon Samson for supernatural purposes, and that same Spirit remains with us to this day. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5 verse 16. We need to understand that often we worry so much about following the world's standards that we neglect to recognize the divine presence in our lives. Instead, we should be filled with the Spirit, which essentially means living under His authority and guidance. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5 verse 18. At this point in the narrative, Samson's personal choices become even more concerning. He went to Gaza, where he engaged with a prostitute. This episode reflects the tragic tendency of the people of Israel over the years, indulging in spiritual prostitution by seeking after other gods. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot with other gods and bowed down to them. They turned quickly from the way in which their fathers walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord. They did not do so. Judges 2 verse 17 They had clearly succumbed to the culture around them, thus betraying the Lord. At this point in his life, Samson, the leader of Israel, was openly living in a manner that echoed Israel's transgressions. This tendency would be his downfall. The Philistines in Gaza discovered Samson's presence with the prostitute and believed they had captured him, watching all the city's exits. However, when Samson was ready to leave, he simply tore the city's entrance gates, along with the two gateposts, off their hinges and carried them on his shoulders to the top of the hill overlooking Hebron. It is an impressive scene, as carrying massive gates for several blocks on flat terrain would be an impossible feat for any ordinary person. This display of strength serves as evidence that even when Samson strayed from God's will in his actions, God had not completely abandoned him yet. Samson was already on a downward spiral when Delilah entered his life, and he fell deeply in love with her. Now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went into her. When the Gazites were told, Samson has come here, they surrounded him and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying, In the morning, when it is daylight, we will kill him. And Samson lay low till midnight. Then he arose at midnight, took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two gateposts, pulled them up, bar and all, 
put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Afterward, it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Judges 16 verses 1 to 4. It is not clear whether Delilah was a Philistine, but her loyalty lay with them and with her reward in silver. The Philistine leaders persuaded her to find out the secret of Samson's great strength so they could subdue and neutralize him. They promised her a generous sum of money as a reward for her cooperation. So, the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Persuade him, and see where his great strength lies, and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to humble him, and we will each give you eleven hundred pieces of silver. Judges 16, five, three times Delilah tried to extract the secret of Samson's strength while the Philistines waited to ambush him. Each time, Samson offered her a false story about the source of his strength, but she persistently pressed him. In the end, Delilah employed the same ruse used by Samson's wife when she betrayed him to the Philistines. She confronted him, crying out, How can you say you love me when your heart is not with me? Then Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me where your great strength lies and how you might be bound that one could subdue you. Samson said to her, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now she had men lying in ambush in an inner chamber, and she said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he snapped the bowstrings as a thread of flax snaps when it touches the fire, so the secret of his strength was not known. Then Delilah said to Samson, Behold, you have mocked me and told me lies. Please tell me how you might be bound. And he said to her, If they bind me with new ropes that have not been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And the men lying in ambush were in an inner chamber but he snapped the ropes off his arms like a thread. Then Delilah said to Samson, Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me how you might be bound. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head with the web and fasten it tight with the pin, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So while he slept, Delilah took the seven locks of his head and wove them into the web and she made them tight with the pin, and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep, and pulled away the pin, the loom, and the web. Judges 16, 6, 14. She also accused him of mocking her, arguing that he wouldn't betray her trust if he truly loved her. Day after day she pressed him until he, irritated, finally revealed the complete truth. His hair was the source of his strength, and if it were cut, he would become as weak as any other man. Then she said to him, How can you say, I love you, when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times, and you have not told me where your great strength lies. And because she nagged him every day with her words and urged him, his soul was vexed to death. And he told her all his heart and said to her, A razor has never come upon my head, for I have been a Nazirite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Judges 16, 15, 17 Delilah wasted no time. While Samson slept on her lap, she cut his hair. While the Philistine leaders lurked in the shadows, bringing their reward in silver, she was free to count her dirty money as the deed was done. Once Samson was defenseless, we are met with these sad and lamentable words. When he awoke, he planned to escape as he had done before, shaking himself to be free. However, he did not know that the Lord had left him. Samson made the mistake of prioritizing his relationship with Delilah over his devotion to God, and it cost him dearly. This serves as proof that no human relationship, no matter how intimate, can surpass the importance of the relationship with God. Samson paid a terrible price for his transgression. His eyes were gouged out, he was chained and forced to work in the Philistines' prison. 
In other words, the enemies of God took full control over him. This is a clear reminder that when God is removed from the equation, Satan takes control. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up again, for he has told me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hands. She made him sleep on her knees, and she called a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him, and the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison, but the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Judges 16, 18, 22. Here we perceive that God had not yet finished with Samson, so why then are we told that his hair, the source of his strength, began to grow again? The return of his hair was an external symbol of his internal repentance and return to God. His true penance would be evidenced in his future prayer to the Lord. Sometimes, to attract all of our attention, God takes us to the lowest possible point. Samson was at rock bottom, but his hair began to grow again. While the Philistine leaders gathered to offer a great sacrifice to their god, Dagon, Samson was busy grinding grain in prison. They were all ready to rejoice because their deity had provided them with food. During this gathering, the Philistines were ecstatic and decided to entertain themselves by putting Samson between the pillars of the temple. However, in doing so, they were putting themselves in a position of defeat. The temple was crowded, with about 3,000 people on the roof. Realizing the situation, Samson begged God to empower him once more so that he could bring down the Philistine temple. He used all his strength, and with one final effort, the temple collapsed on the leaders and the entire crowd. So the lords of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to their god Dagon, and to rejoice, saying, Our god has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. Similarly, when the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who ravaged our land and multiplied our dead. And when their hearts were merry, they said, Call for Samson, that he may entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them, and they made him stand between the pillars. Then Samson said to the boy who held him by the hand, let me feel the pillars on which the house stands, that I may lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there, and on the roof there were about three thousand men and women who were watching Samson perform. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me, and strengthen me just this once, O God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. Samson grasped the two central pillars tightly, thus supporting the house, with his right hand on one and his left on the other. Then he proclaimed, Let me die with the Philistines. With all his strength, he leaned against them, and the house collapsed on the lords and all the people who were there, causing more deaths in his death than during his life. Then his brothers and all his father's household came down, took him, and brought him up, and buried him between Zorah and Eshtaol, in the tomb of Manoah, his father. Samson led Israel for twenty years. Samson, unfortunately, succumbed to the idolatrous culture around him and made regrettable decisions. However, in Hebrews 11.32, 33, he is mentioned in the roll call of Old Testament faith heroes alongside figures like Daniel. This inclusion fills us with hope, for it shows that despite his failures, Samson was able to understand one important thing. He believed that God could use him to fulfill his will.